Another way of looking at this inflation-deflation debate is what are you measuring it in? If you're measuring real assets of the world in dollar terms, you'd be a fool to say that we've had deflation in terms of food, gas, insurance, and education. There could be a case for deleveraging in paper assets that may look like deflation, but there is a lot of money out there, and the next crisis will bring about even more fiat money printing. If you measure the same economic paradigm in terms of gold and silver, you would have seen real deflation as real money gains in purchasing power in terms of housing, stocks, and even necessary things like food and fuel. But let's look at a basket of goods and see how inflation of the fiat currency has devalued our dollars. And since saving in silver was demonetized in 1964, let's start there. In 1964, the average house cost $20,500. The average car cost $3,500. The Dow Jones was at $770. A first-class stamp cost a nickel. The cost of a good college cost $1,570. The cost for a natural childbirth was only $450. The average income in 1964 was $6,000. A gallon of milk cost 95 cents and a gallon of gasoline cost 30 cents. In 2012, we will see that prices went up significantly. But the reality of this illusion is that our money has lost value and that you need more worth less dollars to buy the exact same amount of goods. That $20,000 house now costs $160,000. The average car now costs $30,000. The Dow Jones is at $12,500. A first class stamp costs 45 cents now. That same college education now costs $42,000. The average childbirth now costs $4,500. And with C-sections can go as high as $35,000. The average income now is only $46,000. A gallon of milk will cost $4 a gallon, and a gallon of gasoline costs $3.79. When you start to see that you need 10 times the amount of dollars to buy the exact same amount of goods, you can see that 90% of our wealth has been stolen in this paper Ponzi scheme. One other thing I would like you to notice is that the return on investment of the college education versus the average jobs has shifted dramatically. Where once baby boomers college education cost $1,500 a year and it netted them jobs that were paying way above the average wage of $46,000. Now we have a trillion dollar investment in college education and it has been a poor investment at best and it has been a poor investment, especially since they can't even find jobs for this to even matter. So using the dollar as a measuring stick for inflation or deflation, it's very clear that we've had massive inflation of the currency since 1964. And remember, this is because the criminal elite get to print unlimited amounts of money, not only to spend it first, but the effect of that new money entering into the economy does to their assets and institutions. Their rising boats rise much faster than the common man's salary. So why did they demonetize silver? Well, here is President Johnson's comments at the demonetization of our constitutional silver. Now, all of you know these changes are necessary for the simple reason. Silver is a scarce material. Our uses for silver are growing as our population and our economy grows. The hard fact is that silver consumption is now more than double the silver production each year. So in the face of this worldwide shortage of silver and our rapidly growing need for coins, the only real prudent course was to reduce our dependence upon silver for making coins. If we had not done so, we would have risked chronic coin shortages in the very near future. There is no change in the penny and the nickel, and there is no change in the silver dollar, although we have no present plans for silver dollar production. Some of you have asked, will our silver coins disappear? The answer is a very definitely no. Our present silver coins won't disappear, and they won't even become rarities. We estimate that there are now 12 billion I repeat, more than 12 billion silver dimes, quarters, and half dollars that are now outstanding. We will make another billion before we halt production, and they will be used side by side with our new coins. Since the life of a silver coin is about 25 years, we expect our traditional silver coins to be with us in large numbers for a long, long time. If anybody has any ideas about hoarding our silver coins, let me say this. The Treasury has a lot of silver on hand. And it can be, and it will be used, to keep the price of silver in line with its value of our present silver coin. There will be no profit from holding them out of circulation for the value of their silver content. So here, back in 1964, President Johnson is telling us that silver is scarce, that our uses are growing, that we would run into shortages, and that the consumption of silver is double the production of silver, back in 1964. Now let's look at the same economic reality, but instead of using the fake fiat money that the Anglo-American elite can print out of nowhere, let's use constitutional silver to save in and see what happens to the purchasing power of that silver from then until now. In 1964, the constitutional dollar was 0.715 ounces of silver. 
and using that to translate the dollar price of those 1964 prices to ounces, it would be 14,657 ounces for the average house, 2,502 ounces for the average car. You would need 550 ounces of silver to buy the Dow. You would need three one hundredths of an ounce to buy a stamp. A college education would have cost 1,122 ounces. The cost of an average childbirth back then was 320 ounces. The average income would have been measured in 4,290 ounces of silver. The average gallon of milk, 0.67 ounces, and the average gallon of gas would have cost 0.21 ounces. Now let's see how many ounces of silver would be needed to buy those exact same assets. You would need two-thirds less of silver, or 5,333 ounces, to buy the average house. You would need 1,000 ounces of silver to buy the average car. 416 ounces of silver to buy that 12,500 Dow. You would need two-thirds less ounces to buy a stamp. You would actually need more silver today than you would back in 1964, showing how dramatically the cost of education has risen since then. You would need half as much silver to, to have the average birth today. Here's the really scary thing. Despite the fact that the average wage has increased 766% from $6,000 to $46,000, if we measured that same fact in terms of silver, we would have seen a dramatic loss. In 1964, you would have you would have earned close to 4,300 ounces of silver. Today, the average job would only net you about 1,500 ounces of silver. Milk would have cost significantly less in silver terms, as would have gas. So even though people are complaining about high gas prices, it is relatively cheap versus silver. And please keep in mind, this is using $30 an ounce to value the silver, and is nowhere near the recent $50 high or the real inflation adjusted high of $450 an ounce. So notice how you need dramatically less silver to buy the exact same amount of goods in 2012. This is real deflation and real increase in purchasing power. Deflation actually benefits the common man as they get more things for their dollar. The only time it hurts is when they're in debt because those debts become harder and harder to pay back. It is at that point that people usually default and the banker's assets don't perform. The elite, on the other hand, cannot have deflation as their debt-based paradigm system would collapse upon itself and hurt their assets and their way of life. Let's continue this historical line of thought. If you had saved $10,000 in 1964 paper dollars and stuffed it under your mattress, you would have immediately seen that $10,000 in 1964 bought far more than it does now. In fact, using the rigged government inflation-adjusted numbers, you would need $69,000 just to have the equivalent purchasing power of $10,000 in 1964. That 1964 $10,000 today would have the equivalent purchasing power of only $1,442.55 in 1964, meaning that if you wanted to spend $10,000 today, you would have only need $1,442.55 to buy the exact same amount of goods in 1964. Please note that these calculations are using the official government inflation numbers, which I have pointed out in previous videos are rigged to show lower inflation results using their four tricks. This has warped the reality of our economy and has not only led to massive distortions in the economy, but it has also led to massive malinvestments in capital. The true extent of these malinvestments will not be fully realized until after the dollar debt paradigm ends. And we see that the world we have built up to serve the consumer, banking, real estate, insurance, military, prison, and government economies was the largest waste of money ever. Let us now look at what would have happened if you saved $10,000 face value in constitutional silver, which would have been about 7,150 ounces of silver. Priced at about $30 an ounce, that same money would be worth $214,500 today. What cost $214,500 in 2010 would have cost $30,851 in 1964. That is a significant increase from the paper value of their money in real and nominal inflation adjusted terms. It is over a 95% loss in real purchasing power in the paper value, but when you see the difference between the purchasing power of the paper versus the same amount of money saved in constitutional silver, it is truly staggering at the level of thievery we have been putting up with. This generational theft has empowered and enabled the worst in our society to profit off this paradigm. And the only way to fight back is the silver bullet and the silver shield, so that you sell your paper assets in their casino and buy real, tangible, physical silver. While this generational theft is significant, we are nowhere near the end of this story. The real shocker will be when silver gets close to its real inflation-adjusted high of $450 an ounce, and the relative purchasing power it will have then. What will be more amazing is when the dollar paradigm ends, 
and all paper assets collapsed compared to the real tangible value of physical silver. There were a few voices that warned about this unsustainable system in 1965, like Charles de Gaulle. Le fait que beaucoup d'États acceptent par principe des dollars au même titre que de l'or pour les règlements des différences qui existent à leur profit dans la balance des paiements américaines, ce fait entraîne les Américains à s'endetter et à s'endetter gratuitement vis-à-vis -vis de l'étranger. Car ce qu'ils lui doivent, ils le lui payent, tout au moins en partie, avec des dollars qu'il ne tient qu'à eux d'émettre, étant donné les conséquences que pourrait avoir une crise qui surviendrait dans un pareil domaine, nous pensons qu'il faut prendre à temps les moyens de l'éviter. Nous estimons nécessaire que les échanges internationaux soient établis comme c'était le cas avant les grands malheurs du monde, sur une base monétaire indiscutable et qui ne porte la marque d'aucun pays en particulier. Quelle base En vérité, on ne voit pas qu'il puisse y avoir réellement de critères, des talons autres que l'or. 47 years later, we now see how dangerous the system has become.